Hello and welcome to Stuff That Interests Me with me, Dominic Frisby. And over the course of the next 20 minutes, we are going to solve all of the world's problems. And here to solve them is Mark Littlewood. Now, Mark is the Director General of the IEA. That's the, e the Institute of Economic Affairs. It is a think tank that has been with us since the 1950s. It believes in heinous things like free markets and free trade. And Mark has been the, the boss for about eight years. Before that he was an economic campaigner and he was the spin doctor uh, for the Liberal Dem Democrats. So Mark, welcome to the programme. Um, if we're going to solve the, solve the world's problems, we, we need the, the world's problems, we need to work out first what's, what's working well and what's working badly. So why don't we start by establishing that. What's working well is that we're going to leave the European Union. I'm pretty confident that we will leave it successfully. And this provides a world of opportunity because exiting the European Union is probably the biggest blow to the overarching regulatory state that I have seen in my lifetime. So a panoply of golden bright futures become available to us. That bit's going well. What's going badly? It looks like we might use that newfound freedom in order to repl replicate Venezuela here in the United Kingdom. So uh, extending the range of choices available to the UK, I think, is to be applauded. But making damn sure we don't take a wrong turn is going to be a key battle for me and I think for those who actually believe in free markets in the years ahead. So by that, you're alluding to the fact that you, you think there's a possibility that Jeremy Corbyn may win the next general election. I think that's possible, but uh, uh, rather worrisome as well is, as I put it, the last general election you had one party running on a very interventionist anti-free market manifesto. That was the Conservatives. Yeah, I was say, and then, uh, you, and, and the then you had the Labour Party <laughs> running on an even more anti-free market <laughs> interventionist manifesto. So I'm a bit worried that we have lost sight of the things that have made this country great and prosperous and we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And a whole swathe of 1970s state control and socialism is back on the agenda. It hasn't happened yet in any large, uh, in any large way, but it could happen. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that the threat is the Labour Party. I think it's the present climate of opinion, which is highly sceptical about the role that the price mechanism and private enterprise and free markets have to play in making us richer. That is a dangerous and non-benign environment from my ideological perspective. Why has the Conservative Party be got so kind of controlling? And it's kind of, it, it, they, they, they want to control everything and the, and the control seems to come from the kind of centre of the Conservative Party rather than the right of the Conservative Party, which is a bit more sort of delegatory, if that's the right word. I mean, why has that happened? And, and they, they, they and, and it, in my mistake, the, ma the mistake they made in the last general election was trying to be too controlling and trying to occupy the middle and trying to pander to, you know, Guardian readers' Guardian. mentality. They, they've had a thoroughgoing loss of confidence, the Conservative Party. And one thing you've got to credit Jeremy Corbyn with, I mean, I know some in the Labour Party claim that they actually won the last uh, general <laughs> election, uh, which is um, slightly curious, and as you think that a good number of seats were wrongly given to the Conservatives on a dubious offside decision then the Conservatives did actually win the last general election. But credit to Jeremy Corbyn, he has shifted the parameters of debate, I mean, in a direction that I'm not comfortable with. But what he has basically marched the Labour Party way, way, way over to the sort of Marxist-Leninist uh, horizon. And the Conservative Party, not really having a comfort, an ideology of its own that it feels comfortable with, has just been sort of dragged behind. So he has shifted the entire political balance in Britain to the statist interventionist left. Uh, and in my view, our present Prime Minister is a tactician rather than a strategist, um, is a politician rather than a thinker. So they're always slicing the difference. She has no, she has no clear ideology, in my opinion. Surely the answer is patently obvious. In just as the Labour Party has shifted to the left in a kind of repeat of the 1970s, the Tory needs, need to do the same thing, shift to the right, find their own thatcher and win the argument and game over. 
I think that's probably true. I mean, you can't win an argument if you don't put the argument. And the Conservatives There's have only not... one Tory putting the argument, well, about three, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, I mean, the, the Conservatives yeah. really haven't put forward a coherent case at all. Uh, and worse than that, actually, at their recent conference, and before that, Theresa May's speech at the Bank of England, you, you hear these things that make my heart sing. You know, we've got to remake the case for free market capitalism and enterprise. Free market capitalism has been the best thing for, re for relieving poverty and spreading prosperity across the planet. I'm about to punch the air when I hear this. And then they segue seamlessly into their, them saying, and that is why we need to have an absolute energy price cap. <laughs> And that is why we need to have an enormous state house building program, the largest since Macmillan. So the, the, the narrative, which they seem to have started to get right, just does not fit with the specific policy recommendations that they're bringing out. In fact, I am struggling to think of one policy brought forward by the current Prime Minister since the general election which moves us in a more free market direction. I can't think of a single tax cut that she, she or the Chancellor have proposed. I can't think of a single deregulatory measure, a single privatisation of state assets. So it's pointless having the whole free market capitalist narrative if you then segue seamlessly into state intervention right across the board, and that's what's happening. The problem with the free market capitalist narrative is that because of the way it's been framed by the left, it is seen as evil. It is seen as, as uh, bringing out the worst in human beings and it is seen as exploitative. Um, and I think they're making, they're trying to do the same thing to free speech, by the way. And so that free speech will be seen as a bad thing mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm, same way mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. you know, and so that is an essential argument that needs to be cleared up. Free markets are what make people like I've had an argument with an anarchist and I was trying to explain to him that anarchy and free markets are one and the same thing and he wouldn't have it. Right. Um, well, the, I mean, my view is this. If there was a fault on, on my side of the argument, if the IEA and our fellow ideological travellers have done something wrong, it is probably over the years we've talked rather too much about the rich and not enough about the poor. So we celebrate entrepreneurs, and so we should. And we celebrate businesses growing, and so we should. Then we get rather numerical about GDP might go up by another 1% if we cut corporation tax by another 5% or whatever the argument might be. And I think we've actually got to make the case that free market capitalism has done more to lift people out of absolute poverty than any government program on the planet could possibly uh, aspire to. So I think we've got to be pointing to the successes of China and India, for example. Uh, I mean, since the days of Mao Zedong, uh, when 90% of Chinese people lived in absolute poverty, China has moved in a capitalist direction. I'm not holding it up as the poster boy of free market liberal economics, it isn't. But it has shifted in a radically capitalist direction from where it was and now about 10% of Chinese people are in absolute poverty. That's 10% too high, but what gains? So I actually think those who believe in free markets need to point much more to the outcomes at the lower end of the income scale. How many people are there in absolute poverty in the UK? Um, virtually none. Virtually none. I mean, absolute poverty is defined as being on $1.90 a day or less. I dare say if I claim zero, it would just about be possible for one of your viewers to find one person who is on that level or less, but uh, nothing like that. Of course, the problem is now in the West, we don't really care about absolute poverty anymore. We care about relative poverty, mm. the gap between the, the, the rich and the poor. By the way, a gap that in terms of income has not widened at all in the last quarter of a century, although most people believe it has. So we now start to get into this absurdity that if the rich get richer and the poor get a bit richer, we actually claim that poverty has worsened, even if everybody has actually moved up. Um, I think the argument needs to be won. There are several things that we need, to, need to be pointed out. The left associates capitalism with what the right would call crony capitalism mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. corporatism. So CEOs of major corporations don't invest. They don't, they've got no skin in the game, and yet they're being paid millions and millions mm -hmm, of pounds. Mm -hmm. um, you know... 
people having a house and by virtue of stupid planning laws and a crazy monetary system, the house, yep. you know, a generation now can't afford a house. The older generation all think sure. they're brilliant investors just because of the fact they bought yep. a house when they're in their mid-twenties. You know, these are symptoms of crony capital. Like, yep. The housing is the biggest manifestation of, in of wealth inequality sure. in the UK. And it, but our housing, to call it a housing market is, is, is wrong because it's not a market. It's, it's, exactly it's completely right. rigged. That's completely right. I mean, I think a problem is that if people are angry about the status quo, I share that anger, but we can't pretend that the status quo is a free market liberal state of affairs. It just isn't. I mean, for example, a common refrain you'll hear from the left, and one I actually agree with, is corporate lobbyists are too powerful. You know, big business is too powerful. But what big business is doing is lobbying the government because the government sets the rules and sets the regulations. Uh, if, if there was far less to lobby uh, about, there would be considerably less lobbying. So the problem nearly always comes back to the fact that the state is such a big player in our affairs. And before we readily embrace the fact that the United Kingdom is broadly a free market liberal economy, uh, I'm not really sure that neoliberalism, the hate word of yeah. uh, much of the left, has really been tried here for some considerable time. If you were to take this metric, I'm not saying it's the only metric you could take, but if you were to say what proportion of GDP, what proportion of national income is government expenditure? In the UK, depending on exactly how you measure it in roundabout terms, it's about 43 or 44 percent. Not far off half. I mean, a little less than half, mm. but not by much. If you look at the fastest growing economies in the world, not just today, but uh, historically over the past couple of hundred years, you would find that the state sector is about 20% of GDP there or thereabouts. Most economists would agree that the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, had a state sector that probably accounted for about 70% percent of GDP. There are arguments about that because the, the data is not hugely robust. So you have the Soviet Union, government controls about 70 percent of the economy. Fastest growing economies in the world today and over the last 200 years, about 20 percent of the economy. And the UK sits in the middle of those. We have strategically decided to position ourselves halfway between successful growing economies and the previous Soviet Union. I'm not sure that's a particularly good place to find yourself on that spectrum. How do we reduce the size of the state? Because in, even under Thatcher, in the Thatcher years, even though that was nominally uh, a, a small state, mm -hmm. um, half generation, say, the state actually grew considerably over the over the 80s and 90s. So well, how do we re in yeah. real, really reduce the state? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we need to look a lot more at what you might call private sector crowding in, in economic terms, rather than public sector crowding out. So I think it's extremely difficult in one fell swoop to, for example, privatise the National Health Service or completely privatise our education system. And in fact, if you did do it in one fell swoop, I think there would be hell to pay, at least for a good number of years. But I think that you've got to give people considerably more power within the public sector system. So even if you are going to have state-financed healthcare, for example, for everyone, not just for the poor, I think you've got to find ways in which the expenditure follows the patient rather than it being uh, delivered by bureaucrats. And I think we've actually got to reframe our argument. We've actually, in a, in a world in which people are more and more sceptical about politicians, uh, if you, over our lifetime, the, uh, the faith that people have in the political elite has collapsed, and I think we've got to frame our argument about, do you want these services provided to you by politicians? Or do you want them provided to you in the same sort of way that you get private sector services from Deliveroo, Uber, or anything else that you might use? That, I would split from the question of who actually funds it. Um, who funds it is one question. But even if things are funded by the state or made possible by the state, that doesn't mean that the state itself has to control it. So let's take healthcare. The NHS is considered to be the state religion, effectively, of the UK. Indeed, criticism of the NHS is probably considered now to be more treasonable than criticism of the House of Windsor. Uh, you cannot say a bad word against it. It's unpatriotic um, to do so. But I, I think we should ask ourselves the question, isn't just what we want to be sure of that all Brits get good health care? Do we actually need to insist that the government is the provider of that service? Uh, by the same token, we want to ins ensure that all Brits are well fed. 
But we don't nationalise supermarkets. We actually allow Tesco's and Asda and Waitrose and Sainsbury's to compete against each other for an absolutely core service that all human mm. beings need, food. And if that works on the food side of the economy, why wouldn't it work on the healthcare side of the economy? So I think we've got to give people confidence that everyone will get access to healthcare, to education, and to the food supply and to the water supply, and divorce that from who actually provides it. The problem with that is that people will then think of the railways. Now, for sure, the railways, for sure, mostly the railways function better mm -hmm. than they did when they were nationalised. They're faster, you get where you're going quicker and so on, most of the time. But they are a rent-seeking paradise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, the exploitation of the customer that goes on, the fees we pay, mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. that tickets are structured. It is, it is verging on the evil, and, in my opinion. And what you, ha what you have with the railways is you have a private company exploiting a national monopoly, effectively. Would you agree with that? No, I would query that to some degree. I mean, I, I think that without getting too technical, the railways were privatised in a very ham-fisted way. I think we should have actually sold the track and the rights to rolling stock together rather than separated those two and kept National Rail uh, uh, as a separate But until entity. anyone else can build a track, well, there are no competitors. You see, this is... I, I think you're in danger, if I may say, Dominic, of falling into the sort of leftist socialist trap here. <laughs> of the, the, here, is a, here is a natural monopoly, therefore the state must control it. The truth of the matter is is, by and large, that wasn't what I was saying. by and large, uh, railways are under uh, extreme competitive pressure, certainly in some areas of the country. I live right next to Clapham Junction Railway Station. I do indeed choose on almost every day to take the train into Victoria and then walk to work. And it is true, I think, that there's only one provider of that train that I take. But I could take the bus. I could take a taxi. I could buy a car and drive myself to work. I could, if I actually got myself a bit fitter and healthier, cycle to work. There are a range of different ways you can travel. So railways are under competitive pressure from alternative travel mechanisms, not just from other train providers. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, but you're talking about cities. Like, if you're coming from Bristol to London or Edinburgh to London, you've got... You can either drive, which is horrendous. Edinburgh to London, you can fly. Or you can fly, or you can get the train. Yep. And each of, each of those methods are their own little, have got their own little rent seeking. Uh, you know, if you drive, you pay all the various sure. taxes you pay on petrol and so on. You know, so there has to be a better way than what. Well, happened. you need a level playing field between these different modes of transport. But I mean, to take. Uh, let's take London to Glasgow as an example. Uh, I went up to Glasgow a couple of weeks ago. I actually took the train up because that suited me at the time of travel and the price was set, and I took the plane back. So the, the train provider and the plane provider are competing for my custom. If planes decide to add a zero on the end of their fees, many more people will take the coach or the train, or decide not to travel. So th there are competitive pressures here. We mustn't actually just put into one box a particular mode of transport and believe that it is hermetically sealed from alternative routes and there, alternative means. It's not. OK, I accept that there are, there are competitive... There is competition within it, but you will not win the private, privatisation argument if you defend the railways too much. No, I think that's true, but the problem you have here is if anything ever goes wrong in, in the market at all, it's considered to be a market failure. It, it is not a market failure if the market actually does produce some outcomes that you don't like. Things go wrong in a free market. If they didn't, no company would ever go bust. And companies do go bust. And I think it's quite important to accept that even if there are some outcomes we don't like, the response to that is not more state control or price fixing or the rest of it. What we should do with the railways is to stop subsidising them. I was actually shocked to do a radio interview a couple of weeks ago against George Galloway and almost uh, finding myself agreeing with him. He said, what's outrageous here is we're still throwing subsidies at these private companies. Well, we shouldn't. We shouldn't be subsidising rail over road or we shouldn't be penalising air travel uh, over bus travel or bicycle travel. We get out of the way and allow uh, the free market to properly compete. By the way, that would also allow the free market to build roads and to charge for their use. Well, that is the thing. We need to be able to build more roads and more railways. Sure. Um, 
Right, now we are running out of time and I feel that we've barely begun. I think we've solved most of the world's problems. Well, no, we, <laughs> we, we've, we're right in principle. Now, Mike, I'm currently working on a book about tax and my theory used to be that the, the, the state will carry on growing while it has control of the issuance of money. Mm -hmm. And until that control of money is taken away, that's the kind of zero yeah. patient. That's yeah. the... The, uh, the points on the track that you need to change. That's what started in 1914. We came off the gold standard and yeah. it's grown ever since. But I'm, I'm now coming around to the view that you shape society by the way you tax it. And there is a failure in our tax system to distinguish between wealth and income. Mm -hmm. And it's all about taxing income. But in fact, if people are working, the one way to reduce inequality is by people being, being able to keep income. Sure. And so we've got to, um, well, wealth goes mostly untaxed, and that's not me arguing for a tax on wealth. So tax is my zero patient at the moment. How would you change the tax system? Do you agree that tax is the way, tax and subsidy are the way to, to yeah, fix? Yeah, I mean, what changes do you make to the tax system? Uh, I would radically simplify it. I think the United Kingdom, by most estimates, has the longest and most complicated tax code on planet Earth. It is several times the length of war and peace. It is absolutely impossible for any one individual to understand all of it. It is riddled with loopholes because politicians like to make lots of particular announcements to favour one industry or another. I can remember George Osborne at a budget a few years ago saying how important it was to support the children's cartoon industry. So if you invest in children's cartoons, you get a tax break. This is absolutely well, fantastic. Well, does a lot of voiceovers for children's <laughs> right, cartoons. Right, well, you, you may be a benefit of that, of that particular when kickback. That, when that subsidy was taken away, a lot of work dried up for uh, us. Well, that may well be the case. <laughs> but my, my plan and strategy would be to try and get the rules onto, rather than 6,000 or so sides of paper, onto six. It needs to be simple. That's not just, I think, a, a good way of having a predictable economy. Easier said than done. Um, well, is it? I mean, I reckon I could probably write it onto six sides of eight, four, actually. You need to have a straight level of income tax, taxable on all income, I think, from the first pound to the last pound, however, however much you make. Uh, I think that uh, wealth is somewhat harder to actually tax, um, but I think you could have a tax on property values. Um, we do, in, to some degree, through council tax. I reckon I could do it so on you're, six So you're an advocate of land value tax? Yeah, I think that would be a better tax than some that we have. So on it's simpler and lower, but those are different considerations. That? Um, uh, VAT is not of itself a terrible tax, because, partly because it's relatively easy to levy a tax on consumption. I'd get rid of all the exemptions. Uh, the idea that we're going to have arguments about whether there should be a tax on women's sanitary products or children's food or clothing or newspapers. No VAT on books, but there is a VAT on Kindle downloads. This is yeah. absolutely absurd. So if we're going to have VAT, apply it uh, completely across the board and possibly lower the rate. So I, I reckon Duties, I could write this Petrol, petrol, uh, fuel, uh, sorry, petrol, booze, fags? Uh, well, much, much lower, and the taxes there should only be levied on, in economic terms, internalising the externality rather than you as, rather than as revenue raises. So if the cost of smoking a packet of cigarettes is going to cost a pound to the National Health Service, that should be the extra duty on a packet of cigarettes, not a penny more. It shouldn't be a revenue raiser. The government should be neutral on lifestyle. If you uh, want to smoke um, rather than drink or drink rather than uh, eat fruit, that's a matter for you, road, not for the government. Road tax and, pe and um, car taxes? Well, I'd, I'd levy all of that on a road user duty. I mean, and again, what we're not doing with regard to any duties on fuel or on cars is actually just charging people for the cost of the roads. It goes way beyond that, actually. Road users are paying more than the costs of road upkeep and road use, and then subsidising rail users, to go back to mm -hmm. our previous point. So those yeah, taxes, I think, can only evil. be justified, can only be justified if they reflect an identifiable cost to society or to the public purse associated with that product. So I reckon, I oh, six sides easily, I reckon I can get it on three Inheritance sides of tax? I four. Uh, I, I would abolish it. It's it's extremely hard to levy. It's escapable. I mean, another uh, another good basis of levying taxation, not that I'm an advocate for squeezing as much out of the private sector as we should, is that it should be easy to collect and difficult to gain. 
inheritance tax is pretty easy to game the system. Uh, as long as you give away money um, more than seven years before your death, which isn't always predictable, but is relatively predictable, you dodge inheritance tax and it raises a tiny fraction. Get rid of stamp duty. Why do we have a tax on transactions involving houses that's different to a tax of uh, transactions on involving a motor car? Uh, absolute nonsense. Because so, you're even if you bought a house that's worth a lot of money. That's why. Uh, You've got to be punished. Well, I mean, that's if, if you want to punish people for being rich, stamp duty is still not the best way of doing it. I mean, confiscate wealth above a certain level. I'm not advocating that, but that would be an easier, easier way of doing it. So the problem is you've got this build-up in our tax code of tens of thousands of different fiddles made by politicians over the years. And I would just bin it. I would go straight to ground zero and say we are going to write it again and it must be no more than 5,000 words in length. Uh, that would be quite a challenge. What Chancellor would have the courage to do that? Well, I mean... Jacob Rees-Mogg? You, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, possibly. Um, I mean, of course, the previous Chancellor uh, set He up... said it. He said he was going to do it, Osborne, and then it doubled. The yeah, tax code uh, doubled absolutely. under his and, and I think I'm right in saying he was also the guy who set up the Office for Tax Simplification. Yeah. Uh, those people Awkward. are in no danger of being made redundant any time <laughs> soon. So it requires... Look, all of these things require political bravery, right? There, there's no shortcut to it. And the incentives in our political system is always to add regulation, to find little announcements that benefit one particular sector of society mm. or one pet project. And that just aggregates and aggregates and aggregates. And I think you get what's sort of the pebble effect, really. That each, the time, you add, yeah, each time you add a regulation or a new rule, it's a bit like throwing a pebble into a river. Throw one pebble into the river, it doesn't really disrupt it that much. Half a dozen, not disastrous. But at some point, you've got a serious blockage and a dam and the river stops flowing or certainly stops flowing anything like as fast or reliably as it um, has previously done. And that's what the burden of regulation and endless different tweaks to the tax code is doing to our economy. Well, the opportunity to make the changes we need to make is here with Brexit. So let's hope that the, the right choices get made. I wholly agree. A chance to get it right is what we have, but a chance is not a guarantee. Mark Littlewood, it's been a real pleasure. If people want to find out more about you and the IEA and, and your work and so on, t tell us how we can do uh, that. Please go to iea.org.uk. You will find there loads of articles written by us arguing about a free market approach to every sector of the economy and you will find a catalogue of research going back many decades on pretty much any topic you care to name. So iea.org.uk is where to find out more about us. And how do we follow you? Uh, well, you can find me on Twitter if you are interested in free market economics, uh, listening to uh, a middle-aged man before his time ranting, and if you're interested in Southampton Football Club, then you can follow me on Twitter at Mark J. Littlewood. Mark Littlewood, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Well, folks, thank you very much for listening. A reminder that you can get this show as a podcast or you can get it on YouTube or you can get it on Facebook. We are on all sorts, whichever medium you choose, you can find stuff that interests me. If you like the show, please rate us, please review us, give us nice reviews and, and five-star ratings and all those kind of things because they do help. I'll, I'm Dominic Frisby and I'll be back with another programme at the same time next week. Boom, 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 boom.